like to say good evening to everyone. I am always happy to be among the sisters and the brethren, especially when it comes to preaching and teaching this unadulterated gospel that have been given unto us in the close of this age. And this gospel is for the saving of our soul. Mm. I always like to let you know how Yahweh brought me into this great teaching. And I like to always keep that in mind. Prior to coming into this school, Yahweh bringing me in, I was a minister out in the religious world. I was a Baptist minister. And I thought that I was called by God to carry his word. Always was a person that would go to church. I was raised up that way, carried to church by my parent from a baby on up. And was always instructed to, wherever I go to, go and join somebody's church and try to live a good Christian life. And being obedient to my raising as a child to my parents. I did my best to be obedient to that. <clears throat> I was raised up in Detroit, Michigan. Moved from there in 1959 to Los Angeles, California. Immediately, I joined the church and served as an usher in the church. And then from an usher to a deacon in the church. And did my best in serving. And then was called into the ministry. As being a deacon, you have a chance to be with the preachers more than the members of the church do. And ministers would always say to me that God was working with me and that he wanted me to carry his word. And that was something that I always hated to hear. Even from a child when I would go places with my father as a little child. And people would say to my father, Ed, that boy is going to be a preacher. And that would make me so mad. <laughs> and I always hated for people to say that. And I've tried to think why that I felt that way. I mean, since being in this school. And every week, or at least two times a month, as coming up as a child, my parents would always have the preacher over to the house on Sundays or a deacon. And my mother would work, go all out to prepare dinner for the preacher. And mind you now, it was 14 children of us. And I was the youngest one of them all. 
And I would sit there and observe the preacher, and, and the man looked like he just never got enough to eat. <laughs> but it was one thing that my parent would never do. When the preacher or the deacon would come over and they would prepare dinner for them, they would always set we children down to dinner with the preacher or the deacon. I've heard people say that their parents would make them sit back in the room until after the preacher ate, and then they would get the last, but it didn't happen this way with me. And, but while sitting at the table, the preacher was always the first one to be served. And it looked like the part of the chicken or the bread that I wanted, he would always wind up with it. And I guess that kind of turned me against preachers. But I never would say anything about it. Now we're gone from that. Uh, and with preachers telling me so much that God wanted me to be a preacher, it just began to dwell in my mind. And I was always a person that if there were anything that I could do, I was raised that way to help someone, then you do it. And I guess with that upbringing and with them telling me about God calling me into the ministry because I would sing in the church and be on the programs, teaching Sunday school and all of that too, and BYPU, then it just began to bug me day and night. And I remember reading a scripture in the Bible. I couldn't tell you yet today where I was reading it. But it was, I was reading and it was just as if God at that time was speaking directly to me about he would give my wife and my children over to uh, the Gentiles or what have you. And that I didn't want. And it scared me so bad until I couldn't sleep that night. I'm cutting it up short because we want to get on down into the teaching. But I think it's always good to always consider from whence you came. And it's always good now since we're in school and it, we have become to understand that even when we did not know Yahweh, he was working with us all the time, preparing us for this great ministry. And I got up that morning, about six o'clock in the morning, and I called the pastor of the church, scared to death, and I told him, I said, Reverend, I got to talk with you. He said, well, can it wait? I said, no, sir. I want to come over with you, put the coffee pot on, and uh, I'm going to talk with you. He said, Mixon, can't you wait a little while later on until we get up? I said, no, sir, I got to talk with you now. So he invited me over. Now these things, I think they are important. If they wasn't, I wouldn't be wasting up the time. And I went over and I sat down with him. And I said, Reverend, I believe that God is calling me to carry his word. And he said to me, he said, wait, Reverend, let me go in here and get my cigarette. And I'm sitting there trembling because I never had 
had an experience like that before in my life. And he and I, we sit there and we talked. And I told him how that things had been going with me. And he said, well, Mixon, he said, I think it's a wise, very wise decision. He said, he called some other preacher's name there. He said, we've been noticing you very closely and to how that you're working in the church and how you're so faithful at it. He said, well, happy to have you aboard. He said, now Sunday, what you'll do, we'll go to church and say, you'll get up and make the announcement. And I did. So then, I become to be a preacher, and they set up a time for my trial sermon. And I never will forget that sermon that I preached. It was from the fifth chapter of Acts, and it was dealing with Ananias and Sapphira. It was at the time that after the day of Pentecost had fully come, and the apostles had went on out and began to preach. And many of the people that had possessions, they sold everything that they had. And they brought it and they laid it at the apostles' feet. You see. And distribution were made by the apostles. And there were one man by the name of Ananias and Sapphira. And they had sold a possession. And they had coveted one with another, which Ananias did with his wife, to hold back a certain part. And that was my trial sermon. And I thought that I did a pretty good job of it. And the people in the church, the deaconettes and what have you, and the older people in the church, they all come to me after that and say, yes, God really did call you. And I went on through the ordination and everything. And then I began to associate with many of the ministers of the Reverend there in Los Angeles at that time. Go to ministers' allowances and what have you and begin to question them of questions that I had had from a child all the way up, but I never had an answer. But each question that I would ask, or each pastor that I would ask these questions to, they would give me answers to those questions, but it just didn't register. And I just couldn't. And I never would agree when they would say, do you understand, do you see what we're talking about? I would just sit and look at them, you see. But I just couldn't perceive the answer. I couldn't understand the answer that they gave me. And when it would come time for me to preach and what have you, the pastor would tell me, well, Mixon, you're going to preach, or Reverend, you're going to preach Sunday. And sometimes he would come to me like on Saturday or Saturday evenings and tell me. Now, that would make me mad. And I would say to him, I said, Reverend Thomas, now, look, from now on out when you want me to preach, you give me a three or four days' notice because now we gotta, I got to get the Bible, got to get concordance and all of that and pray and try to work up on a sermon and write it all out, <laughs> try to study it and memorize it in order to get up Sunday morning to deliver my sermon. Now that went on and on and on and on. And every time that I would get up and preach a sermon in the church, I found out when I would walk out of the pulpit, I would be condemned in my heart and in my mind. In fact, I would be afraid to come out of the pulpit because when church is over with, then the people usually come up and shake the reverend's hand and what have you. And many of them had questions, and I didn't want to be questioned about nothing. 
because I knew within myself I was not sure of the answer. And I felt this way about it, that I did not want to take, as I knew it to be then, God's word and deceive anyone. And that thing troubled me. And I was troubled for the full time that I was in the ministry out in the church. And I preached a sermon once, and it taken my text from Isaiah, the sixth chapter, where Isaiah said in the year that King Uzziah died, I also saw the Lord. High and lifted up, and his train did fill the temple. And I went on and put that sermon together. And it goes on in there to show, back there in the book of Isaiah, where that God was not pleased with the leaders of Israel at that time for leading his people astray. And I got up that Sunday morning, there was a couple of visiting ministers there, and I preached that sermon. And that was the hardest sermon that I could preach because I went on in to show how that God is not pleased with his leaders the way that they are leading his sheep. And went on in through this sermon to show how we, that are the leaders, we will go all over to try to get people to come to church. And we would spend an hour to an hour and a half taking up collections. And then take about 10 or 15 minutes and get up and calling ourselves preaching the word of God. And as going through this, I would always come back and say, I said, God is not pleased. Now, you're supposed to get an amen on that if it's going over good with the preacher. Now, the deacons is sitting there, and if the preacher don't say nothing, they're not going to say amen. <laughs> I didn't get an amen that Sunday, you see. So, and I knew right then I had preached my last. <laughs> and... Now, after preaching, then you got to stand at the door, and as the people go out, you shake their hands and what have you. Well, when the last person left, I went on back, and the pastor stood, and there he was sitting down in the chair waiting on me. And when I walked in the door, he looked at me. He said, I won't say what he said, what he called me, but he pointed his finger. He said, where did you get that mess from? I cannot tell you the hurt that went over me or went through me. And all I could say to him, Reverend, did I lie? And he told me then, he said, Reverend, before you ever preach another sermon in this church, when I tell you you're going to preach, you come to me Saturday night down to this church. You meet me down here. And you get up there in the pulpit and you preach your sermon to me before you get up on Sunday morning. Now that did it. And I never was one that would talk back to my peers, you see. But this time I said to him, I asked him a question, Reverend, who called me? Did you or did God? He said, you heard what I said. Well, I left church. That son and got in my car and went on just for a ride. And I stayed away from home all that evening. And when I come back, my wife and children, they were asleep. And I got down on my knees that night, and all I knew was Lord and God. And I prayed to God. And I said this in my prayer. Lord, I will not preach another sermon. I will not preach another Bible study until you prove to me that you did call me into the ministry. That is just as present today with me as it was then. And I prayed three prayers that night. And that title, Lord, God, and Jesus Christ, that was all I knew. 
And that Monday morning, I get up and get in my car, and I go on to my place of business. And I open, well, I didn't open up. I sit there in the lot, in my parking lot, just sitting there in the car as if I was in a daze. And it's a building across the street, which was a va vacant building. And I was just staring at it, but I wasn't looking at the building. And I sit there, and a man pulled in. I suppose they had opened my place. I don't know. I couldn't tell you how long I sit there. But anyhow, the fellow come on in, and he says, this, what, what time is this place open? I say, it's open now. So I went on in and did the work for him, which only taken me 30 minutes or something like that. And then I went on and I sit down at my desk. I would always take my Bible with me. And I begin to read the Bible. I don't know today where I was reading it. And it was a fellow that walked in. And he said to me, hi there. And I jumped and I looked around. And I, taken the, I pulled a drawer and shoved the Bible in the drawer and closed the drawer. And the fellow says to me, he said, what are you reading, your Bible? I said, yes. He said, are you a minister? Listen, listen to me close. I was ashamed to be called a minister because I didn't want to even talk with nobody because I had asked for answers and I never got my answers. And to get in a discussion about the Bible with people I felt that I was not qualified. To talk with them. So the fellow says to me, he said, are you a minister? I said, yes, I am. He said, what faith are you? What denomination? I said, man, I don't believe in no denominations. He said, I'm glad to hear you say that. He said, but what church do you belong to? Are you a pastor of the church or what? I said, no, I'm assistant pastor. So he says to me, he said, oh, you're a Baptist then. After I told him what church I belong to was the Love of God Missionary Baptist Church on Vermont there in Los Angeles. He said, then you are one that believe in water baptism. I said, yes, I do. He said, well, why do you believe in water baptism? And right away, I started getting hot. <laughs> I said, man, wasn't Jesus baptized in water? He said, yeah, but he wasn't talking to you. <laughs> now, I'm standing there. Now, I'm not cursing, folks. I'm just being honest of what went through my mind, and I said it, too. I turned from the man and I went to walk away. I said, Lord, here come another damn fool. <laughs> and the minute that I said that, a voice thundered within me. When you hear my voice, harden not your heart. That was the best thing that ever happened to me. And I turned and I started walking back toward the fellow. And he says to me, get your Bible and let's study it. Now, mind you now, I, thinking now that, remember, you just prayed the prayer last night. I had forgot all about that. <laughs> and that fellow stayed at my place of business from around 11 o'clock that morning until three or four o'clock that evening. And every question that I asked that man, the answer come just like that. He even had some slides of the charts and everything else. He went out to his little station wagon and got the charts and got his uh, projector and brought it in, put it, he said, can I put it up there? I said, sure. <laughs> he put it up there and he flashed the pictures of these charts on the wall. And <laughs> we had forgot all about what time it was, and my business at that time was flourishing. 
Uh, the phone never rang, neither did a car pull into my driveway. <laughs> and when I looked up at my clock, I said, wow, it's after three o'clock. I said, fellow, where did you learn all of this? He said, school that I go to. I said, how much does it cost? He said, it's free. <laughs> I said, can I go? He said, well, sure you can. Now, who I'm talking about, and many of you old uh, members in the school, uh, that was Dr. Ray Robinson. I never have had anyone to expound up to me the way that that man did that day. And now that's how I come into the school. And that first night I went down to the class, I don't think I heard, I couldn't even tell you who was on the floor. The class then were held on right off of uh, Vermont, I believe, 24th Street. But let me show you something, folks. I think this would be important, too. I promised the man that I was coming, and I think they were holding classes then on Tuesday, Tuesday nights. Is that right? Yeah. And now, mind you, now this Monday, he said, we're having class tomorrow night. He said, I live in the neighborhood. He said, I'll just come right by your house and pick you up. I said, oh, no, 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 no. I'll be there. Just give me the address, and I'll be there. Not knowing that he had been stood up many times. People said they'd come and they'd never show up. He said, I, and I have a woman that I have to pick up in the neighborhood. He said, I, I'll be by your house and pick you up. I said, I have an automobile sitting right out there. I said, and I'll be there. He said, are you sure? I said, look, my word is my bond. In other words, if I tell you I'm going to do something, I'll do it. <laughs> he said, OK, give me your phone number. So I gave it to him. And I went home that evening just as happy as could be of the things that I had learned. And then I, it was a young lady that, the barber that my wife and I knew, and she was as a play sister. And we were always talking about the church and religion and what have you. And I just ran over to her house and I told her all about what had happened. I said, I want you to go with me. She said, well, I'll let you go and you come back and tell me. <laughs> but I didn't want to go by myself. So then the next day come around and the closer the time come for me to close up my place of business, I close it up at five o'clock. The devil starts speaking in my mind, saying, now, you don't know what? Now, you don't know what that might be. Say, that might be the Muslims or anything. Say, man, you know you don't want to get tied up in no kind of junk like that. And I went on home, and I'd taken a bath and everything, and sit there and ate. And about 5.30, a quarter to six, Dr. Robinson, he called me. He asked for me. Reverend Nixon, my wife, told me. And I went to the phone, he said, uh, this is Ray Robinson calling, say, uh, now I'm fixing to leave home now and I'll be right by your house to pick you up. I said, no, sir, I'll be there. <laughs> but the devil working with me all the time, put everything in my mind now to keep me from going to this class. Now, I think this would be beneficial because I think we all have come through the same thing. See, the devil ain't worried about you as long as he got you. But then when he find out that you you're being drawn away from him, then, then he gets real busy then. I didn't know that's what was going on then. You see? So I got ready and I start thinking, you know, the fellow, you told the fellow that your word is your bond and he's in business down the street too. You see? And if you don't go, then you, you come by your place tomorrow morning, now what you gonna tell him? See, now that was a good boy speaking. <laughs> So I had no choice about the matter. So anyhow, I got in my car and I went on down. And uh, when I found the building, there was no place to park. I said, oh, now I can tell him I came. <laughs> but I couldn't find no parking space. So I takes off from in front of the building, I drives on down to the corner, makes a right hand turn. And instead of just keep on going that way, the car just turned at the next corner and come on down the next street. <laughs> I guess down to Vermont, instead of turning left, I done turned right. And when I know anything, I found myself right back in front of the building. And there's a parking space right in front of the building. <laughs> I 
I just sit there, I said, well, I ain't got no excuse now. So I went on in the building. And, and Dr. Robinson had told me, he said, now when you come in, so just the earth should be at the door, just tell her you are my guest and she'll bring you on down to the front. No, I don't want to go to the front. Because out in the church, when a preacher come into the church, then the earth should take him right on up in the pulpit. Well, now that I don't want to go into. See? Because I don't know what's being taught, and I don't want nobody up there telling me to come up and have something to say. So I sit down the second row from the back. And when I sit there, now there's people sitting here, and I had to sit between them and people sitting all down there. First thing I looked, I looked over the audience, and I saw white, and I saw color all mixed up together. And the chart's way down there, you see. And I couldn't tell you who was on the floor. But anyhow, whoever it was, they was up teaching, and they was laughing and what have you. And I said, now this, this I don't see what they got to laugh about. <laughs> In other words, they're not serious enough. And I began to look at the white and the color, and that was a question that I had out there in the church world. Why is it, Reverend, that we have so many churches? You got a black, a colored church. She was calling colored folks then. <laughs> <laughs> and here we got a colored Baptist church on this corner. Go right down the next, you got a white. Why is it that we have to have so many churches? How come we all just can't come together in one church and they'll save money stop begging for money and everything else <laughs> see and i was very serious about that and my pastor told me one day reverend we are not ready for them and they are not ready for us that hurt me i said reverend jesus died for our sins some 1900 years ago when are we going to get ready and all of this, when I comes in and sees all of this, it was just, I, as I say, I don't know what was said that night. And then after class was dismissed, or before it was dismissed, Dr. Ray Robinson, he was sitting down in the front, and he was bald-headed at that time. And I, every time he would look back to see if I was back there, I'd kind of duck <laughs> behind the person that was sitting in there. Because I didn't want to be called up to the front. I'm telling you, if you don't know what you're talking about, you don't want to be up in front of nobody. Especially when you're dealing with what I thought then was the Word of God. And it's the same way now with this gospel. If we don't know what we're talking about, we need to sit down and be taught. Because look at this convention. We have over 4,000 people. And many of them are coming sincere in their heart and their mind. They want to know. And I always feel at every class when people convene, I have that feeling that people are coming there because they want to know. And it is for us to preach this gospel in its utter simplicity, whereby that one might see and understand and receive this knowledge and understanding. And uh, then the moderator got up and said, we have a visitor with us tonight, a Reverend Edward Mixon. I said, oh my goodness, I gotta go to the front. And said, would you stand? And I stood up, I said, I'm, I enjoyed everything I heard, I'm happy to be here and I will be back and I sit right back down. <laughs> and then they said the benediction, now I'm trying to get out, get on out the door. And these people remind you now, I told you there are people sitting here and I'm here and here and people sitting here. And as soon as I turned to walk out, the one next to me just shook my hand. Oh, we're so happy to have you, Reverend. Oh, please come back. And you know, I think it was about 30 minutes before I moved out of that spot. <laughs> and I was just sweating down. And everybody greeted me the same way, begging me to come back. And last but least, here come the founder, Dr. Harris and Dr. Gross, and Ray Robinson introduced them to me. And Dr. Kenley, when we got to him, he shook my hand. He said, now you come back, now you're here. I said, yes, sir, I'll do that. Then I, I think it was about a week later, then I went back to class. And to cut it up short, 
Then I met Dr. Harris and Dury McCoy and what have you. And from then on, I worried those people to death. <laughs> and they're sitting here looking me in the face. And every day, not one day, but every day, I was at one of the other houses, at Dr. Harris, up to Dr. Kenley, or with Dr. Dewey McCoy. And when I would go over to Dr. Harris, Dr. Marion Harris, uh, Dewey would be over many times, and Mitch, he would walk downstairs, and you see, and we just had a good time. Now, what I'm trying to tell you is that love that was manifest like I never had seen before in my life. And to walk into their houses or to walk, knock on their door. And many times I was so ashamed of just I mean, every day. And Dr. Mary Harris, I want to apologize. And Dr. Mary Gross, I want to apologize for being such a pest. But I want you to know it has paid off. And I thank you for it. And I thank each and every one of you, knowing that it was the spirit of Yahweh that Yahweh through the founder had put into you that caused you to invite me in and to have so much patience with me, even in my ignorance and in my stubbornness. I can never forget it. And since being at this convention, I have sat right back, back in that seat and seen all of the older ones in the school and tears have come into my eyes, remembering when I come into the school how much patience they had with me. But I'll tell you this, after I was sent out to set up schools, I have manifest that to all of those students that have come in. You taught me patience. The Father through you taught me patience. And it has paid off. Now we'll get down into the teaching. Okay. How many more minutes do I have? <laughs> and I think it would, this is beneficial to the younger ministers that have gone out to set up schools. You see, it will help. And that's why I felt it was profitable to say these things. Because people don't know. And when they come to class, many of them are truly seeking and wanting to know. And have a little patience with them. How many more minutes do I have you say? Twelve minutes? Oh, my goodness. Well, let's do it this way. Let's have St. John 17 and 3, please. St. John 17 and 3. Now, listen. Now, Yahshua the Messiah, the night before he was crucified, he was hanging, uh, he was praying the prayer out in the Garden of Gethsemane. And this is the prayer that he's praying to the Father within himself. And when we, as the Holy Spirit that is in, on the floor, our prayer is the self-same prayer that Yahshua made back there 2,000 years ago. That prayer is still going on. These words spake Yahshua the Messiah and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy son. Read. That thy son may also glorify thee. Read, please. As thou hast given him power over all flesh. As the Father Yahweh has given Yahshua power over all flesh. That he should give eternal life to as many as thou that hast That he him. should give eternal life to as many as the Father hath given him. And this is life eternal. Now listen, folks. This divine vision and revelation that Yahweh has brought to us in the year of 1931 and have sit down and we've sit at his feet and he've taught it to us. And when we preach and teach this divine vision and revelation, yet today, 
then this is life eternal. Read. And this is life eternal. Read. That they might know that. Now we are the day, we are the day down here at the end of this age. That they might know thee. Read. Thou only art the true That thou only art the true heir. And Yahshua And you are also Yahshua the Messiah. Whom thou hast sent. Whom thou hast sent. Now the thing that we're speaking to you by this divine vision and revelation, it is coming directly unto you from Yahweh. And it is life eternal unto you. I mean today. Now if it's no good now, if you're leaving it back there and not bringing it present today, it will not do you any good. And if we are not, if it is not life eternal that is being given to you today, then you waste your time by coming. Now, we want you to know that. See? Now, let's go back here and begin at Moses, as the Holy Spirit has instructed us to do. You see? Now, we must begin at Moses, being obedient to the Holy Spirit. Moses was born at the time of a death decree. You see? All of these things are types and shadows that are being set up back here with Moses and the children of Israel and they are just types and shadows pointing to the reality who is Yahshua the Messiah. Now, even the children of Israel are types and shadows. The only reality is back here is Yahshua himself because he is the author and he is the finisher of our faith, you see? So therefore, Moses is born at the time of a death decree. When Yahshua the Messiah is born, he's born at the time of a death decree, you see? All right, now, his mother, takes him and put him in an ark of bulrush and put him out by the river's brink. And Pharaoh's daughter come out to bathe. And she saw the ark and had her maid to bring the ark to her. And she opened the ark up and saw it was a Hebrew child. And she resurrected Moses out of that ark. Now what we're preaching is the gospel of Yahshua the Messiah, which is the death, the burial, and the resurrection. To cut it up short, here's what we're going to do. Then Pharaoh's daughter taken Moses and raised her in her own house until he was 40 years of age. At the age of 40 years of age, uh, he is instructed to go out or he's stirred up to go out and look upon his brethren. And when he goes out, he sees an uh, Egyptian taskmaster smiting one of his Hebrew brethren. And he said to him, why ye wrong one another? And the one that was in the wrong said unto Moses, are you intending to kill me as you did that Egyptian yesterday? You see, and Moses knew that these things were known. So then Moses, after three times that, then Moses had to resurrect and come on out here into the wilderness of Sinai. And that's where he met these women at the well. And he was made a shepherd over Ruel's sheep, his father in law. And therefore, Ruel gave Moses his oldest daughter, Sapphira, as a wife. And Moses was out here for 40 years. Remember, he was 40 down here when he played out. Now he stayed out here for 40 years. And it's at that time when that name, Yahweh, Elohim, was revealed to Moses at this burning bush. And he was told to take that name and go back down to the land of Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let his son Israel go three-day journey that they might worship him at the mountain. You see? Now, it was through that name that the children of Israel were delivered. And before leaving out of Egypt, Yahweh in the 12th chapter of Ex Exodus told Moses and Aaron. Uh, uh, let's read that, please. Exodus 12 and 1. Mm -hmm. And Yahweh spoke unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt. Now remember, Yahweh, or the Lord God, is down in the land of Egypt, not up above the sun, moon, and stars. And it says, The Lord, or the Yahweh Elohim, spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt. And he goes on then to set up time with the children of Israel. And he told them that this month would be the first month of the year. You see? It will be the first month of the year, and that month was April, Abib. Now that's set up by Yahweh, setting up his time with Moses and the children of Israel. See? Now the devil has changed that time from April to January. See? Now to show you that these preachers out here don't know anything about what they're talking about, and they haven't been sent by Yahweh. You see? Now if they were sent by Yahweh, then they would have told you what's the first month of the year. You see? Now then you come up with the month January and it has been set up and changed from April to January. And then they set up a, the first day of April being April Fool's Day. 
So then the devil has food you. You see, now if the religious world don't know these things, and you got to begin at Moses, then they don't know anything else to teach you about God and his eternal purpose. You see? And it says over in Daniel 7, 25, that the man would speak great swelling words against the Most High and think to change the time and the law. Now, the children of Israel had to kill the lamb, take the blood and put it over the lintel of the door, the two side posts in the basin that the blood was held in. And they was to eat that lamb and have it in them and have their loins girded. And the morning of the 15th, the children of Israel, that cloud began to leave the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. You see, now what we're doing, we're setting up a death because now this lamb had to be without spot and blemish. And Yahshua the Messiah, come on in, he said, I am the door. And John, when he went to John to be water baptized, he's the lamb. So he's the lamb and he's the door. Now, how did he get to be all of these things? Going back to Moses, as it was revealed to us in 1967 at the first convention, and the founder said to us that this deep esoterical secret that has, this is the greatest esoterical secret that have ever been perpetrated upon man's heart and mind. In other words, that's when he's at the bunny bush, I, you, ask you, I, you, I will be what I will to be. Now, the only way that you're going to understand this man here is by going back to Moses and having the Holy Spirit through someone teaching you about Aya, Asher, Aya, then you can see he will to be the, the door, he will to be the lamb. You understand what I'm saying? So now here he's the lamb, he's the door, and now when they crucify Joshua the Messiah, they got to nail him in the hand, the two hands, crown of thorns on the head and nail him in the feet, make one, two, three, four points of blood. You understand? So therefore, then they make that journey, three-day journey, out of the land of Egypt. You see? And they were baptized in the cloud and in the sea, and that cloud led them a three-day journey on up to Mount Sinai, and that cloud hovered on top of Mount Sinai. And it is at that time where Yahweh told Moses to gather the children of Israel and have them to wash up and clean up, for he would speak that law down into their hearings against the third day. So June the 6th, 9 o'clock in the morning, he spake that Ten Commandment law down into the hearings of the children of Israel. Now that's why Yahshua the Messiah, the same Yahshua that was back here, he's over here being the Messiah, and he's coming to fulfill in the 17th chapter of Matthew. That's why he got to take Peter, James, and John up into the mountain. He got to lead the multitude out into the wilderness. He got to go up on top of the mountain. He got to set. Now guess what his text would be? The same thing that was back here in the 20th chapter of Exodus, that's what the text got to be over here because he's fulfilling what he instituted back here. Then that second tribute takes Moses there and they're having to buy you up in the mountain that they saw the Elohim of Israel and he transformed into that tabernacle. And then he instructed Moses to come down into the wilderness of Sinai and build this tabernacle just like the tabernacle that he saw up there in the mountain. Now that tabernacle is a... One tabernacle, but it's got three compartments to it. The most holy place, holy place, court roundabout, represent the Father, the Word, the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Now, Elo, Yahweh Elohim is the archetype of the original pattern of the universe. Now, with the knowledge of this pattern, which Yahweh Elohim is, then these charts that after Yahweh had caught our founder up and given him this divine vision and revelation, and told him to go forth and to teach his people, and say he walked around for two years before he could say anything to anybody. And then he had to have Yahweh Elohim show him how to draw these charts up. And these charts are made up according to this pattern. With that pattern being a most holy place, a holy place, and a court roundabout, then that's where you've got to have this Adamic plate here, and it's got to have three compartments to it as the most holy place, the holy place, and the court roundabout. You see, in other words, you've got one, two, three. You see? And then when you come on over here to the uh, Noah plate, you see, it's one, two, three. Everything's coming by the pattern. Then you got the um, uh, Abrahamic and Melchizedek plate, which is the most holy place, the holy place, court roundabout. Now you, here you have that migratory pattern, which is the same thing on here with the children of Israel coming out. Now here is laid right down on here where you got Egypt, wilderness, Canaan's land, which is a type of the most holy place, holy place, court roundabout. And everything that's laid down with these vessels in this tabernacle is Yahweh instructed Moses. And that's in the 40th chapter of Exodus. Everywhere these vessels are placed, Yahweh Elohim had Moses to place these vessels in here because his whole purpose has got to come by this tabernacle pattern, such as the altar here with the brazen altar with the four horns on there. When they kill a sacrifice, they got to take the blood from the sacrifice and put on the four horns of the altar. So this pattern is dictating the whole purpose of Yahweh. So you got the principal blood here. The laborer is sitting there between the door and the altar. And that labor had water in there where those dead sacrifices had to be buried therein. So that's, for this is truly the gospel that is being preached. And when Yahshua the Messiah come in, he said to the Jews in Matthew 7, 13, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate that leadeth unto destruction, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. You see, but he said many will go in therein. So the only way that we can preach the gospel 
according to the scripture is having a profound knowledge of the pattern itself, which is showing for the death. Now, when you enter right into the gate, that gate that he asked us to enter in at, that's death. And the next thing we see is burial. The next day is the door or the holy norn of which represents a resurrection and that puts us standing in the holy place. So therefore we're preaching the gospel and now we can take this uh, pattern as an imaginary loose plate and just run it all the way down on each plate that there is and that same principle has to be matter of it. Death. You understand what I'm saying? Blood or death, burial. Uh, and uh, that, that angel at the gate represents a resurrection. Death, burial, resurrection, Blood, water, spirit, and the principle of 40 because Moses saw the vision up there for 40, Adam in the garden of Eden for 40 days and 40 nights. Now the pattern just coming all the way down through the ages and destination and it's just overturning and overturning. These principles that are laid down, that Yahweh laid down in this pattern for us to come knowledgeable of him as Paul is saying, who served into the example and shadow of heavenly things. So you got death, burial, resurrection, blood, water, spirit, 40. 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 Now we come to Yahshua the Messiah who is to fulfill all of these things according to the scripture. So he did die. He was crucified. That's the death. And he was buried in Joseph's new tomb. And he was resurrected very early that third morning. Ain't that right? And he tarried on earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Then he ascended on back to heaven on that 40th day. And on that 50th day, he poured out his spirit into the hearts and minds of mankind. And that was the day of Pentecost. And that was the greatest gathering that ever has been in the history of mankind under the name of Yahshua the Messiah. Now, here we are now, here in Dallas. And this is the second greatest gathering under the name of Yahshua the Messiah. And if we go back and find out what happened, after the day of Pentecost, in the second chapter of Acts, and see the apostles went on out preaching the gospel and the things that they ran into. Now we're just in a repeat of the thing now. So therefore, let us get as much knowledge and understanding that we can whilst we're at this convention and be sincere in our hearts and in our minds that Yahweh might write his new covenant in our hearts and in our minds. Because if Yahweh does not reveal himself, Yahshua the Messiah at this convention, you see, and I wish that he would, because I don't want to go back out there. You understand? But just in case, if we have to, remember, Yahweh can turn the devil loose on us. And remember, the Pope is coming into the United States. And just like after the day of Pentecost, that big bad boy Paul, Saul, you understand, was breathing threats and persecuting the Yahshuans. And now here we're going on back out. Now, how do you know that Yahweh will not just let the devil stick him on us? And as John in Revelation is saying, he saw the souls under the altar saying, how long, how long, Father, and true. He said, just a little season. And said, white robes were given to them. And said, just a little season until your fellow brethren be killed as you were. So we'll just go on out there. And it just doesn't matter. If the devil want to kill us, it don't make no difference. Come on and do us a favor and get it over with. You understand? But we're going to preach this gospel of Joshua the Messiah so we can go on, go on home. For our second speaker, I'd like to call Dr. Roger Jackson from the Los Angeles branch, Dean, State of California, member of the International Board of Trustees. Good evening. Now I can see why everybody's frowning when they come up here. And I believe me, I tried all I could to get out of this, but uh, as one of the kids said today about that he just has been a hard taskmaster, that Bob Harris is a hard taskmaster. <laughs> <coughs> but nevertheless, I'm indeed happy to have the opportunity to, to uh, speak before you. And I too would like to say something about my coming into school. And this could be helpful for somebody. And we all had our first time coming in the school. And I'm sure it was all under different circumstances and what have you. But <coughs> in the majority of us, we thought when we first came down here, we was doing somebody a favor to get them off of our back. <laughs> no, you weren't doing them a favor. You was doing yourself a favor, but we just didn't know it. 
Now, I recall when I first came down here, or when I was first invited down here, there was a woman by the name of Bill Yates. And I know most of you know her. Not most, but uh, quite a few of you know her. And in the event that you don't, then you probably know before you leave here. <laughs> <coughs> now, I must say, excuse me now for coughing, and I'm not going to say it no more. And this woman kept bugging me about this school. Well, that wasn't my bag. I'd stopped going to church because I knew the preacher was crooked. Every time you turn on your radio, something was wrong. And uh, they was being dispersed and this, that, and other. So I said, well, forget that. So what I was into then was playing poker. That was my game, playing poker. And so uh, Vera, just, Vera and Jimmy Gates and I think Elvira and Joyce, they happened to be living uh, at a friend of mine's. Well, it was written from a friend of mine. They lived in the front and him and his wife lived in the back, the Blackshires. Now, I had promised that woman faithfully that I was going to the school with her. That was to get her off of my back. And, you know, you just keep on lying and lying and lying, and finally you run out. So I asked her, I said, well, now, what time do you say that school starts? And she told me. That was on a Saturday. I said, all right, I'll be here. Do you know that Sunday morning, now, I'm standing at home, I'm waiting till they leave. Then when I get down there, now I had the time confused. I didn't even see J Jimmy's car sitting out in the front. I got out and I'm whistling, going on through the back, because we're going to get this poker game on. And Vera hollered out the window. So you're still going? I said, well, I thought you was gone. <laughs> I gave myself away. <laughs> She said, no, we don't leave at such and such a time. I said, I thought you told me such and such a time. She said, no. So I said, well, let me go back in and tell Junior, my, uh, the guy that's running the game. So let me go tell him. Now, his wife had been, uh, uh, at that time, was having class out in Santa Monica, that Masonic Temple. So I went, now, Bert, Junior's wife, had been out there one time before. I said, Bert, you've been out there. I said, what is it like? She said, oh, honey, it's a mess. She said, they got, she said, they got pictures all up around the wall. And <laughs> <laughs> and they're saying, this is Jesus, and that's God. And I said, oh, my goodness. And Junior, <laughs> he started calling me Rev already. He said, now, Rev, just go ahead on so you don't promise and lie to the woman so much. Just go on and get it off your back. Well, I guess I will. So I went on, I said, well, I'm ready. So we went out there, and like she said, they had them pictures all up around the wall. And I said to myself, Lord, what have you got me into now? <laughs> See, now later to find out it wasn't what he got me into, it's what he got me out of. You see what I mean? So uh, I think at that time, Dr. Fred Allen Sr., Dr. Fred Allen Jr.'s father was the moderator. We didn't have no long drawn out moderation like we do now. I think we had about three aims, if that many. And they introduced the first speaker, that was Dr. Robert Harris. Dr. Harris got up and he roared like a lion for about a half an hour. <laughs> and I liked that, because that's what I was used to. Then they introduced the founder of the school, Dr. Henry Clifford Kennedy, the founder of the school, founder and dean at that time. And Dr. Kennedy got up there and he put his ear, saw a in his ear. And he said, I'm indeed happy to be here. Now I said to myself, uh, look, let me tell you this too. Now when I came in, now I tried all kinds of excuses, just like Moses did. I told Bill, I said, well, look, so I, I, don't, I don't have no uh, a suit, you know, no tie. Now I knew that when you go to church, you're supposed to have on a tie and a suit. I knew that. But I wasn't expecting to go. That's why I called myself leaving late, thinking they was gone. I never had no suit, no tie. She said, well, that don't make no difference. Now, I know this to get it. I said, plus, I've had a drink. <laughs> now, I know, now, I know that'll do it. 
She said, that don't make no difference. I said, what? <laughs> now, that's how I got trapped. But anyway, when Dr. Kennedy, I said to myself, I said, the main speaker. I said, now, that other fellow, talking about Dr. Harris, I said, now, he should have been the main speaker. Because Dr. Kennedy got up and he was, you couldn't hardly hear him, you know. And look, and they put me right on the front row. I mean, right on the front row. And I don't have a chair. But anyway, I got way down in the chair. And I could feel, it's, now this is my conscience bothering me now. I could feel everybody's eyes right on the back of my head. <laughs> and them people were probably wasn't thinking nothing about me. But I'm talking about my conscience. You know what I mean? And my head was just burning, my ears was burning. I said, I know they talk, because you know that old saying, that old superstition, we was all in that. When your ears burn, somebody's talking about you. My ears were just, and I said, I know they talking about me. So when Dr. Kennedy got up there, it wasn't long for that old man got loose and tore that place down. But now what he done was this. Now he knew how I felt from what I'd been taught and the condemnation that I was under. Now that man went right here. That's why I always love this thing here because now that is really what opened my eyes up. He said, now you take back here in the Garden of Eden. Talking about back here with Adam and Eve. He said, now it wasn't but one man and one woman. He said, now Sir Walter Raleigh hadn't been thought about. That's that man in Bennett Tobacco. So he hadn't been thought about. He said, there wasn't no whiskey mills back then. You see what I mean? Now, that made sense. He said, there wasn't but one woman, so he couldn't have been running women. <laughs> now, that made sense. Now, when he said that, like I told you, I was sitting down all, you know what I mean? And doing like this, <laughs> when I, I kind of raised up. And I said, well, there might be some hope for me after all. <laughs> But now first, he had to get my attention because what I've been taught out in the world, all they do is just burn you down with condemnation. You see what I mean? And, th and they were teaching nothing but what you call morals because they didn't know anything else. But when he said what he said about that, wasn't no, uh, 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 Sir Walter Raleigh hadn't been thought about, wasn't no whiskey mill, and wasn't but one woman, he couldn't have been running women. Now that made sense. Now I kind of perked up and I said, I might be some hope for me after all. Now, that's how my attention was got. He had to come down on my level. That's his other word, just like this man Adam died in his conscience. You see, now, if, say, like if uh, one of the men that, uh, let's just use anybody up there, Mitch. So if Mitch fell out of that chair, now, why would you come up here to pick him up? That's where he fell. That's where you got to pick him up. Now, since the man fell in his conscience, see, then that's where you got to pick him up. Get the point? Now, don't that make sense to you? Now, that's what he done to me. And when he done that, I've been to class every since. And I haven't thought about going nowhere else. And I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that the man did have a divine vision revelation. And I don't think that we can say too much about Henry Clifford Kinley. And we're not worshiping no man. We wouldn't talk that Dr. Kinley, he didn't give himself no credit. Never did give himself no credit, but now he did say this, that Yahweh had done more through that black body than anybody else you know of. But as far as putting honor upon himself, he gave all the honor to Yahweh. See, and that's what it's all about down here now. Now, let me say this about that. Now, in this plate here, you take Adam, this first man that Yahweh created and put on the face of the earth, and Adam wasn't born, he was created. You see what I mean? Now, Yahweh created that man from the dust of the earth. Somebody get me uh, Genesis 3.22. Genesis 3.22. And Yahweh Elohim said, Behold, the mm. man has become as one of us. Now, this is after the transgression, because now Yahweh told that man that he could eat of all the uh, trees of the garden except the tree that was in the midst of the garden, which was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See? Now, let me say this about that, too. Now, it's been said that there was sex up in the garden. 
that is not so. See, when you look at it, this is a type of heaven. All along this plate here, that's the type of heaven. Now, when Yahweh created the angels, he created a numerable couple. You see what I mean? Same thing with the planet. See, he haven't, since he created the creation, he hasn't created no more stars, no more suns, no more moons, no nothing. He created enough to begin with. And that's the way it was with the angels. Now, that's what this typified here. Heaven here. You see what I mean? And Aaron brought it out beautifully the other day. How that this man's eyes was closed to the natural, it was open to the spiritual. Is that right? Now, by them being in that state, and somebody also, I said it's one of them children sitting there in Sunday school. You can take a child and let him get up and down here all day long naked, two or three years old. They ain't thinking nothing about you out there. They just having a ball. Why? No condemnation. That's where Adam and Eve was. They were both naked and they were not ashamed. You see what I mean? Now that's up there what you call the most holy place. Now their eyes was open to the uh, spiritual and closed to the natural and they weren't looking at one another like we do now. You see what I mean? And same thing about some little children. They can run up and down here all day long naked and don't think a thing about nobody sitting out there. And same thing about an animal right now today. An animal do whatever you want to hear thinking about you. And you've seen that. I'm talking something you can see and look at. Now we come down here. And also the script them kids had read today about Joshua Sire except about bringing them with children to him, except you become as one of them. Well, why is that? Because like we come as them with children, they don't have no condemnation. And except you become as one of them. You will not enter the kingdom. Now, that's the state and condition they was created in innocency, pure in heart. But now, Yahweh had purpose within himself, a purpose, back in the realm of eternity, you see what I mean? That this man, not only this man, but he himself is coming down out of this pure spirit state. That's what I'm talking about. He had purpose back. You see what I mean? And to prove that, now, the whole witness to say this, that Jehovah, who they call God, did not know that this man was going to do what he done. Now, let me put it like this. Yahweh created a whole universe, sun, moon, stars, and all that, and he knew then that they wasn't going to bump into one another. You see what I mean? Created the, the Atlantic, Pacific Ocean, and all that, come here no farther. Is that right? Now, he knew it was going to be that way. Now, you mean to tell me he didn't know what a mere meat man was going to do? That don't make no sense. And the proof that he did, he had the sacrifice already prepared before the man even fell. And John said in Revelation that he was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. What was he slain for? For the redemption of that one man, Adam. You see what I mean? He knew that. Yahweh knows everything. That was his purpose. That's what he purposed within himself before he ever set it out in execution. Is that right? Now, what he's doing now, he's done set it out to run his course, but he's already purposed back here. So now he had purposed within himself that he was going to condescend himself and take on a shape and form. That is a crucifixion coming from this high and lofty state here down into incorporalization. That is a death or a crucifixion. That is the Passover. Now, he himself is condescending or coming down. Now, don't you forget the devil was in heaven. Is that right? Now, the Look here. Now, what I'm saying now is this. is when Yahweh condescended and stepped down, that put the purpose in motion. You get the point? That put the purpose in motion. Now, Yahweh have condescended and come on down. The devil, he was in heaven. He's got to come down. Is that right? The devil's got to come down, too. Now, if the devil's got to come down, and Adam, he's up in this high and lofty state, he's got to come down. Abraham, got to come down. Israel, got to come down. Everybody's got to come down. You've got to come down. Right. That's what them kids talking about this morning, about you humbling yourself. That's right. Yahweh's not looking. And it's one thing that Yahweh hates, a whole lot of things, but I'm talking about one thing in particular. He hates a, a haughty, a spirit. You see what I mean? And, and vanity, he can't stand it. No, he can't stand that. And let me tell you this, too. Somebody get me, I think it's Daniel, uh, uh, 
Daniel 434. See, he don't like the exalted uh, spirit. He like a, a, a humble, uh, just like Yahshua Sai was a, a contrite spirit. That's what he liked. But when you start exalting yourself, don't do that not with him, because he don't play that stuff. See, there ain't but one big shot, and that's him. And he know that. And, and look at it. You see what Pharaoh done to Yahweh? Pharaoh exalted himself. You see what Yahweh done to him too, don't you? You see what I mean? Now, I'm not just about a thing. Now, you can read all you want to, but you will never read what did you ever run across anybody had a, had a head as hard as Pharaoh. You see what I mean? But now, by the time Yahweh got to dealing with him, you couldn't touch his head with a pot of fuss. That's a fact. You got that? Read it. Daniel 4 and 34. Now, th uh -huh. now this is Nebuchadnezzar. And I would have you to know this too, that Nebuchadnezzar was Yahweh's servant. Just like the devil, Pharaoh, all of them says servant. Everybody says servant. Angels and all. Read on. And at the end of the day. Now this I is what done happened. See, he done got all exalted. You see what I mean? His kingdom and this, that, and the other. You see what I mean? And he would not acknowledge where the thing came from. It's him and his power that got him this, that, and other. And while he was yet talking, Yahweh put that thing on him, and uh, he's out there eating beets with the cattle, you see? And a, 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 a claws, fingernails growing like claw, uh, beast claws and all that, and hair on his body. See, read on. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, mm -hmm. and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever. Now, look at it right there. Now, we've had them come in the school. They've been to college. They've been here and there and everywhere. You see what I mean? And one of them even had to live and say this. He went to college for four years. And uh, he thought there was long to be around here. That's all the time you spend in college and you go to here, you ought to be able to learn something about here in four years. So he knew it all. Gone. See? But now you can stay out. Mother Harris, I think she's the oldest member of the school. She's been right here for almost 45 years. And she's still here and still learning. Now, this other's been here for uh, 30 years or better, and they're still learning. But now, some come down here and they think they know it all. See, Yahweh don't like that. This is a, a forever learning process. Paul said in the ages, even after this thing's done away with, you will still be learning. So we don't want to get high-minded and exalt ourselves. See, and some of us have done that right here in this school and are still doing it. Yahweh don't like it. He's not pleased with it. You're exalting yourself. You let Yahweh exalt you. When you exalt yourself, Yahweh will bring you down. Now, if you're already down, look here. Now, I'm down. If I fall, I ain't got nowhere to go. <laughs> I'm already down. But now suppose I'm up on top of this building and I, I got a long way to go. So just keep humble. Everything's all right. Because Yahweh don't like no haughtiness, the high-mindedness. We done read that today in the, in the thing. High-minded. See, and you let him exalt you. Don't exalt yourself. And everything will be all right. Read on. I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, mm -hmm. and my understanding returned unto me. Mm -hmm. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever. Now, Yahweh done put a hurt on him, see? That's what's happening. Yahweh done put a hurt on him. He's out there eating grass like the beast of fear for about seven years. <laughs> seven days. Read on. I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, mm -hmm. whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, mm -hmm. and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Ah, uh, real. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And all the inhabitants of the earth. Now, we've got approximately, as they say now, about four and a half billion people. They're reputed as nothing with Yahweh. Don't you know what? Yahweh's going to wipe this whole thing out, as you see on this chart right here. A creation abides within Yahweh all eternity. That's why this cloud's drawn right now. This is the whole entire universe within him. He's going to wipe this thing out and create a new creation. And if you're with it, 
then you will also help to determine what's going to be in the next age. That's why it says that when Yahshua shall return with his mighty angels, now if you're one, you will be one with him. That's why God can always say, he cannot appear without me. That's if you got that. That's why we're preaching so hard about Yahshua in you is your only hope of glory. Then if that spirit of Yahshua shall be in you, then if the revelation appearance of Yahshua shall, then you will appear with him. Then we will decide what will be in the next creation. Read on. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. As nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven mm -hmm. and among the inhabitants of the earth. And we used and to sing this song about, have thine own way, O Lord. <laughs> you remember that? We used to say, we didn't say about Yahweh then. But I think the name was, was have thine own way, O Lord. Now he's going to do that. Whether you like it, he's going to do that. Read. And none can stay his hand. And none can stay his hand. Or say unto him, mm -hmm. What doest thou? Mm -hmm. And at the same time, my reason returned unto me. And for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me. Mm -hmm. And my counselors and my princes sought unto me. And I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven all whose works are truth mm -hmm. and his ways judgment mm -hmm. and those that walk in pride he is able to obey now you see that that read that last section again there and all those that walk in pride all he, those that walk in pride high minded and all that he is able to obey, uh, bring down That's right. now Neb nebuchadnezzar found that out the hard way now we just don't have to go through that if we humble ourselves now. But now if you don't, then Yahweh, you can do it the other way. It's all right with him. Don't make him no difference. But it'd be much easier on you if you done it the easy way and not humble yourself now. Don't exalt yourself. Then Yahweh will uh, see what he'll take care of that. But now if you exalt yourself like Nebuchadnezzar done, like some of the others have done, Dr. Kenneth told this thing about this, uh, this uh, goat. And he said, now, there was a train coming down the track. He said, this goat was on the track. He said, now, when the engineer saw the goat, he saw he couldn't stop. And he's blowing the whistle, and the goat just started digging down the ground. You know, he's on the track. And the engineer, now, when he saw, he saw that he couldn't stop, and he saw the goat wasn't going to get off the track. So the engineer, he just said, now, I admire your thump. He said, but your judgment ain't worth a damn. He's going to put his head against up all that iron. You see what I mean? Now, that reminds me about some of us coming here. We're going to put our carnal mind up against all this. You're a bigger fool than that goat. It ain't going to work. You see what I mean? <laughs> now, like we have here. Now I had you to read. Now I want. You, I had you to get Genesis three twenty two, and I want you to get Genesis uh, 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 one twenty six first, and read that first, and keep Genesis three twenty two in mind. Genesis one twenty six. Mm -hmm. And Elohim said, "Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea." Hold and it over right the there. Bird. That's good. Well, read read on a little bit farther then. That'll do it too. And over the birds of the heaven, and over the cattle, and over all the earth. Pick it up and go back and read that again. Genesis 1, 26. Okay. And Elohim said, mm. let us make man in our image, mm -hmm. after our likeness, mm -hmm. and let them rule over the... Now, that's what, let them. Now, he's making a man. Mm -hmm. Now, why would he say let them rule? You see what I mean? He's making a man in his likeness, in his image. Then he said, and I said, and let them rule. He ain't making but one man. Now, if he's making two or three, you can see why he said let them. But he's making one man. But let them rule. Now, 322. And Yahweh Elohim said, Behold, the man is become as one of us. Okay. Now, he made the man in his likeness, in his image. Is that right? Now, would you dare say that he did not know good and evil? Could you say that? 
he made the creation, he said, and everything he made was good and very good. Now, look, that means this. Now, he's made the man in his likeness and his image. Now, if he know good and evil, and he's made the man in his likeness and his image, then he's got to know good and evil. I'm talking about the man. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? And just like I told you, Yahweh condescended and come down. The devil came down. Abraham come down. His, the man, Adam, he's got to come down too. And you've got to come down. Now, look, this man been made in his likeness and his image. Then that means he's got to also know good and evil. You see what I'm talking about? That's why he had to partake of that tree to know good and evil. Because he's made in his likeness and his image. Now, get me, I think it's uh, 1 Kings 3 and 9. <coughs> Come on now, we, the time's running now. We got all these scripture readers over here. First Kings 3 and 9. Uh -huh. Give therefore thy servant. Now, this is Solomon. See? Oh, and you know, Dr. Harris, do you remember when Dr. Kelly would get to talking about this insurance man named Solomon? A lot of times he just break down and cry. I often wonder why he uh, cried about that. I don't know until this day, do you? <laughs> but he'd get to talking about this Solomon and what a nice man he was and this, that, and just break down and cry and talk about Solomon, this insurance man. They do anything for anybody, but I've never understood it yet. Maybe one day I will, maybe one day I won't. <laughs> but I've, every time I read this, I think about what he said about this man Solomon. Read on. Give now Solomon, hold it right there. Now, Yahweh told Solomon before he built that temple. Say, now if you be perfect and walk up right before me as your father David did, then I'll establish your throne forever. Now, when you look back and see what David done, David some, done some things that make me look like an angel. You know what I mean? Yes, he did. Yahweh said, don't number Israel. David jumped up and done that. And, and look at it. And the book says, and Satan suffered David to number Israel. And that caused about 7,000 of Michael with that sword went down and killed 7,000 of them right quick. You see what I mean? Sent you right off the front lines and put him on the hottest line of the battle. Make sure he gets killed because I want that woman. She got to walk around with his heart and them high heel shoes. He just had to have them. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, yes. And he got her too. Now, all, and Yahweh sent the prophet Nathan down, uh, uh, down there to him and told him about all that thing. And, said, and David said, just tell me, and he put it to him in a riddle. And he said, now just tell me who it was. Said that man said, surely that. He said, David, that man was you. He said, what saith Yahweh? Give him uh, uh, so many years of family or put it before the face of his enemy? Man now. David said, oh, he didn't want that because he know how a man is. He said he'd rather... Uh, uh, throw himself on the mercy of Yahweh because a man ain't no good. David knew that. You see what I mean? And it's nothing to a man. I'm telling you, folks. I'm one myself. And if you ain't got something in you, forget it. You see what's going on right in the world today. But David, he didn't want to take no chance with that man. He said, I'll take my chance with Yahweh for his mercy is good and he endures forever. <laughs> yeah, now that's what you better do. Throw yourself on the mercy of Yahweh. And I don't see a thing wrong. I can see you not throwing yourself at my feet or me throwing myself, but I don't see a thing wrong with you throwing yourself at the mercy of Yahweh. I don't see nothing wrong with that and asking him to have mercy on you. See, and David knew better than that. He said, I take my chances with Yahweh. Mm -hmm. See, but now that's some of the things he done. Now, the other thing, but now Yahweh turned right around to old Solomon and said, if you be perfect and walk up right before me as your father David did, I'll establish your throne forever. Now, you know, that, look, that, that, that sounds bad, don't it? But now Yahweh knew what was in David. He put it in. See, and what seems wrong to us is right to you. That's why your thoughts are not his and his ain't yours. And it's a good thing, too. <laughs> it's a good thing. Read on. 1 Kings 3 and 9. Mm -hmm. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, mm -hmm. that I may discern between good and bad. That I may look in Solomon was not but a child, about 19 years of age, when he took that office as king of Israel. But all he wanted was the, uh, uh, the wisdom and knowledge, how to get, uh, guide or uh, direct so great a people. See, he wanted to know good and evil. 
just like this man here. He knew good and evil. This one's got to know good and evil. Hebrews 5, 14, I believe it is. And he come down with us. Now, that's what we've got to know, the difference between good and evil. Hebrews 5, 14. Mm -hmm. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, mm -hmm. even though whose by reason have of use have their senses exercised Exercise. to discern both good and evil. To discern both good and evil. Now, do you see it? Now, <clears throat> you know he know good and evil. Tell this man has no difference between good and evil. Tell uh, David, I mean Solomon, that's what he asked for, good and evil. Now, when it come down with you, that's where this thing come in, when you have the Holy Spirit or Yahshua society in you, you know good and evil. And let me tell you this, too. Now, there's a whole lot of things we've done prior to coming in here. You didn't need the Holy Spirit to tell you was wrong. And there's a whole lot of things while you get in the shoe. You don't need the Holy Spirit to tell you was wrong. You know that yourself. You're born that way. Just like, go over there and get me a... Uh, Genesis, the 20th chapter, and also 26th chapter of Genesis. Genesis 20 and 1. Now, let me tell you this. Now, the law was given at Mount Sinai in 1490. Yahweh spoke the law from Mount Sinai to them people there. Now, Paul put it like this. Said, now, the law was spiritual, but I was carnal. They were too. Them people was calling too. That's why they took it literally and naturally so, because they were calling, but the law was spiritual. You see what I mean? Now look, Paul said also that the, where there is no law, sin is not imputed. Now prior to the law, there was no law, so sin was not imputed. I'm talking about Abraham and that bunch, and they done what they, so if they would, and sin was not imputed to them because there wasn't no law. Then that should I do this, that does it. But now look, don't think they got away with that. Because just like the angels of sin was cast out of heaven, they haven't been punished yet. But now, what they done back there, that was charged unto the third and the fourth generation. So Israel caught all that. You see what I mean? Read on. Genesis 20 and 1. Mm -hmm. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward a south country and dwell between Kadesh and Chur, and sojourned in Gerar. And sojourned in Gerar. All right, read on. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, mm. she is my sister, and Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. Hold it right there. Now, the reason he said because she was a good-looking woman. And Dr. Kidd had mentioned about uh, 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 Mary and Martha. He said, now, when Yahshua Sire used to go around in Lazarus' house, he said, now, don't you think they didn't look good to him? He said, yeah, them were some good-looking women. Now, that means this. You would have had to been back there to know that. You get the point? <laughs> How do you know they were good-looking? That means he had to be back there. You get the point? Now, that's what happened here with Abraham because Sarah was a good-looking woman. So he's going to put off his what? because he's afraid, uh, afraid they'll kill him for the woman. Read on. And Elohim came to Abimelech in mm. a dream by night mm -hmm. and said unto him, You are a dead man. <laughs> now that's in a dream. Mm -hmm. Now he haven't touched her yet, but you already said you are a dead man. Read on. Behold, thou art a dead man mm -hmm. because of the woman which thou hast taken, mm -hmm. for she is married to a husband. For she is, now look, there ain't no law. Don't forget now, I'm saying this happened before the law. Now look, if it's wrong before the law, it's wrong during the law, <coughs> you know it's wrong after the law. You see what I'm saying? Read on. But Abimelech had not come near her, mm -hmm. and he said unto him, Wilt thou slay also a righteous nation? Mm -hmm. Said he not unto me, she is my sister. Now didn't he tell me that was a sister? And she herself said so. Read on. And she herself said, he is my brother. Mm -hmm. In the sincerity of my heart, in innocency of my hands, have I done And he's done just that. In the sincerity of his heart, he done it. You see, Yahweh said, I know you do. That's why I kept you from sinning, look, sinning against me. Read on. And Elohim said unto him in a dream, 
Yea, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart. Mm -hmm. For I also will withheld thee from sinning against me. Now you see that? Uh, look here. That, uh, that's what I was saying. It wasn't all lo lo prior to this. It wasn't all all given except the one was given to Adam. And that didn't say anything about that. I said I committed adultery because it wasn't with one woman. So who's he going to commit adultery with? But now that's after. See, now when he gave the law here, that's when all them do's and don'ts come in. But now prior to that, with Abraham, you didn't have all that. But Yahweh has said, I've kept you from sinning against me. That means it was wrong then, it was wrong during this time, and it's wrong after that. You see what I mean? That's why Dr. Kennedy said this. She said, now if you want a wife, get you one. Get one of your own, not somebody else's. And that go for husband too, women. You see what I mean? And have all the sex you want, and that is pleasing in the sight of Yahweh. He said that at 1040. Right. Do you all remember that? He said it. You see what I mean? But now, you're coming up with something now where you have, and Paul put it like this, the Gentiles who didn't have what you call the law, done by nature, the things contained in the law, more so than the Gen Jews to whom the law was given. Now, this is one of them things here where the man said he'd done it out of the innocence of his heart. Read on. I have withheld thee from sinning against me. Mm -hmm. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. Mm -hmm. Now, therefore, restore the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, uh -huh. and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die. Thou and all that are thine. Mm -hmm. Therefore Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and told all these things in their ears. <laughs> and the men were sore afraid. Mm -hmm. Then Abimelech called Abraham and said unto him, What hast thou done unto us? And what have I offended thee that thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? Now you see that? Now that man's a Gentile. And he wanted to know, just what have you seen in my kingdom you didn't like if you bought all this on me? What, what did I do? He wanted to know. Read on. Thou hast done deeds unto me that ought not to be done. This ought not to be done. But now that man, Abraham, was afraid for his life. Read on. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought, Surely the fear of Elohim is not in this place, and they will slay me for my <laughs> wife's sake. We'll see the fear of Yahweh was in that place. Now that's him thinking. Mm -hmm. See, but the fear of Yahweh was in that place. Read on. And yet indeed she is my sister. Mm -hmm. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. Okay, that'll do it for that. Now get Genesis 20 and 26, I believe it is. Genesis 26 and 1. Mm -hmm. And there was a famine in the land, beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Bimelech, king of the Philistines, unto God. And Yahweh appeared... Well, appeared hold it, hold it, hold it. He went where? He went where? To Gerard. Gerard. Now, that's the reason I said that's the same place that Abraham was at. Mm -hmm. Same place. Now, this is a son. Now, you talk about like father, like son, this is it. And he's going to pull the same thing, you see, in the same city that his daddy pulled. <laughs> Read on. And Yahweh appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt. Mm. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed will I give all these countries. And I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven. And will give unto thy seed all these countries. Hold on. Pick it up where that uh, he put uh, Rebecca off as his sister. That's what I want to get down to. 26 and 7. And the men of the place asked him of his wife. Hold it right. Was that an accident? <laughs> huh? Okay. All right. I Read on. I thought it must and the be. men of the place asked him of his wife, and yeah. he said, She is my sister. Mm -hmm. For he feared to say, She is my now, wife. That's the same thing Abraham done. Same city, same circumstance, same everything. 
Now you talking about a chip off the old block. That's him. Read off. Lee said he, the men of the place, should kill me, me for Rebecca, because she was fair to look upon. Fair to look upon. Just like Dr. Kenneth talked about uh, them women, Mary and Martha. He said, when Yasha's side went around there, now this, that's why we don't have an excuse. See, don't you think for one minute that Josh Messiah was a eunuch made of men? You see what I mean? A born that way he was not. He had feelings and compassion just like you and I. That's why we ain't got no reason, no justification rubbing his face and say, well, now look, if I'd have been like you. No, no, Doc said, look, Mary and Mark said they look good to him. Some good-looking women, beautiful women. That means he got to bend back to that door. See what I mean? Oh, yeah. Now, then some, now you're reading here about Rebecca, a beautiful woman. See, and so was Sarah. That's why they were afraid to go in that city with them because the men were they're afraid they'd kill them to get the woman. That's why they put them off their sister, and they was well treated. Read on. And it came to pass, when he had been there a long time, mm. that Amalek, the king of the Philistines, looked out, out at a window and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebecca, his wife. They were sporting. In other words, they was getting that thing on, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they was getting that thing on. Sporting. Well, let's go home. <laughs> but some of the older folks know what that thing sporting means. Okay, read all that. And Amalek called Isaac and said, Behold, of a surety she is thy wife. Uh -huh. And how said is thou? She is my sister. And Isaac said unto him, Because I said, Least I die for her. And Amalek said, What is this thou hast done unto us? One of the people might lightly have lied with thy wife, and thou shouldest have brought guiltness upon us. Now, see that? Read on just a bit farther. And Amalek charged all his people, saying, He that touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Now, what I'm talking about is before the law, sin was in the world. You see what I'm talking about? And the Gentiles, now, what you read about now is Gentiles and what they're saying, they knew better. It was a built-in thing with them. He said, somebody might have liked a lane with them, and you'd put all that guilt on us, made us sin. Now, Israel, they ain't thought nothing about that, but the Gentiles did. Why? Because it's a built-in thing with them. Paul said the Gentiles, now that's real there, I know. <laughs> Paul said of the Gentiles, which had not the law, they done more by the law than the Gentiles, Jews to whom it was given. You see what I mean? But now here we are down here. Oh, and you as pitiful, just like we have here now, people. Now we should have more people. Now we've got, I think, the count today was about 4,180-something. Now actually we've got more than that. But we've got people in Los Angeles and elsewhere that would not come to this convention. Now get this now. Because Dr. Kenneth said that in 1975 at the uh, convention in Washington, D.C., that we would not have another convention like this. You see what I mean? Now, what they're saying, they don't want to be disobedient to what he said. Well, what about all this other mess they're being disobedient to <laughs> that he said don't do? What about that? You see what I'm talking about? Now, look, let me tell you this. You've heard him testifying about this man all during the convention, that everything he said, it came to pass. He's never missed nothing. Now, Gene Dixon, you got what you call 60 and 40 bat average. This man's got 100% bat average. He ain't never said nothing didn't come to pass. And just like you read the scriptures, and it came to pass, whatever he said, it came to pass. Now, if he said, and if that's what he meant, that we weren't going to never have another like this, then that means he lied. Is that right? That means he lied. Now, here we are, and the closing day will be tomorrow. You see what I'm talking about? Tell me how people think. They're just going to sit back and judge you and the other fellow about something like this. That man ain't never missed a prediction. Never have. Now, if he had admitted that we wouldn't have one like we wouldn't have had it, but since we're having it, then that means they lied, not him. Dr. Kenny ain't never missed nothing. Whatever he said, it always came to pass. And on time, too. You see what I'm talking about? Yes, it did. So we've got a whole lot to be thankful for. And I'm so glad and happy to be a part of this. 
And look, and there's some ministers here that you just haven't heard. We've got more talent here than we can use. I'm, this place is just busting with it. We need at least two weeks to have a convention like this because we don't have the time. We need at least two weeks because we've got some preachers down here make the hair set on your head. I'm, that's right. But thanks be to Yahweh that we did have it, that he allowed us the time that we had. And look, and if the thing went out tonight, tomorrow, it wouldn't make me a bit of difference. I'm, look, you think I'm lying? Test me. And somebody walking around here with a gun in his pocket, that, look, that don't mean nothing to me. Just like when you're the side back here. Get the 18th chapter of St. John. Hurry up now, because they don't run one bell. See, that don't mean nothing to me. Do you recall when Yahshua and Silas out there came to get him? And Peter jumped up and put out that little tin sword and cut off the two of the servants there. Now that was before the Holy Spirit was poured out. Pulled out that little old sword and cut that man's ear out. And Yahshua and Silas said, he that have an ear, let him hear. Picked up and slapped it on his head. You see what I mean? <laughs> and that was under the law. But now look, on this side, on this side of the cross, I'm talking about after Pentecost. Now the weapons of our warfare, they're not caught. Right. But they're mighty through Yahweh. They're putting down a stronghold and all that. It ain't no uh, pistol and all that stuff. Right. Nice. Look, now I bet you one thing. If they had uh, uh, this security thing here like to do the Air Force, half of us wouldn't be in here. <laughs> that is knives and guns. Not, no, we ain't going like that. Our weapons, they, look, they ain't like that. That's not what it is. We should look at it. Yashma Sire, that's our best weapon. That, that's our weapon, Yashma Sire. Not them drums, all that. Yeah. And look, and not only that, that is your antidote. Has that bell rung yet? Well, it's just about to. I know it is, so. But now look, folks, that's the way it is. That is, that's our weapon, and that is our antidote. For whatever the problem might be. See, it don't make no difference. Whatever it is, and Doc King always had us to read this. I think it was Mark 11, 22. Have faith in Yahweh. See, and that'll take care of the thing. I don't care what it is, that will take care of it. He's, look at, he's the one that uh, brooded in the creation. He know all about it. And just like Yahshua said, not one little sparrow don't fall to the ground without him knowing. Now, you're much more than a sparrow. You see what I mean? And if you have that spirit in you, then you are his son. And what greater uh, joy would you rather have than to be called a son of Yahweh? You can't walk for nothing no better than that. Thank you, brother. congregation. I know that you've had a wonderful conference. Absolutely wonderful. And I know you've enjoyed yourself immensely. And I think the quality of this conference has been exceptional. We have had exceptional, exceptional choirs. The music presentation has really been inspiring and beautiful. I think the quality of the speakers has really been good. It's been edifying if you've been listening. Now, <clears throat> Dr. Jackson has mentioned just how privileged we are. I'd like to demonstrate that on the blackboard for you. There is approximately four billion human beings on the face of this earth right now, this very moment. How would I arrive at a figure of one million out of four billion? I would divide that figure by 4,000. And what am I saying to you? I'm saying that every human being that is in this room represents 
one million people on the face of this earth. You understand what I'm saying to you? Do you understand how I'm trying to get you to understand how precious you are? Ladies and gentlemen, you are one in a million. And he made all of us, so what does that make him? Good evening to our guests. It's wonderful to have you present. We enjoy your company. We want to encourage you to be with us. Come back, it's free. We hope that you enjoy yourself through this period of time that we have with you. There's a couple of things we'd like to share with you. You've heard the <coughs> moderator speak of a divine vision and revelation that was imparted to our founder and dean, Dr. Henry C Clifford Kinley. This was imparted in the year 1931. Since this vision, no one on the face of this earth has been able to refute, successfully refute, nor dispute the divine authenticity of <clears throat> the statements that Dr. Kingley has made concerning the Bible and concerning the events that have been recorded in it. I've been around the world, or I've been out in the world, some four times now. And uh, We've been to the ecclesiastical leaders, we've been to the political leaders, and we've been to the scientific leaders of this world. To date, not one has been able to dispute this great work. Now what in the world makes this so different than anything else? Well. <coughs> One thing about it is we have a guide. We have a pattern. We have a pattern that is absolute. We have a pattern that is infallible. We have a pattern that is unerring. Now, let me demonstrate it for you. Let me show it to you. We have some guests here. I would just, if, if you're sitting along the sides, watch me on the big screen, and then if you're right here, just direct your attention to these charts. <clears throat> there was a tabernacle or a structure revealed to Moses by vision and revelation in Mount Sinai. And the Creator Himself has revealed that to Moses and admonished him that when he comes down into the wilderness of Sinai, he is to make that tabernacle just exactly as he was shown in that mount. Don't put your head in it. And to make sure you don't, Moses, I'm raising up Bezalel and Aeolia to help you with it. This is a small-scale model in the wilderness of Sinai of exactly the visionary tabernacle that Moses had revealed to him in the mountain, Mount Sinai. At the conclusion of a tenth plague in the land of Egypt, Israel is now exiting Egypt on an exodus, being led by a phenomenal cloud cloud by day, but a pillar of burning inferno by night. Now watch, as they come out three days to the Red Sea, and then seven weeks later they gather to the base of this mountain, the same cloud that has led them up out of the land of Egypt has now hovered over the top of Mount Sinai. Moses eventually called into this mountain. There the Creator reveals to Moses a stupendous revelation, a pattern, a pattern, a pattern, which Paul by revelation, looked back at and signified it to be a pattern of heavenly things, spiritual things. And scripture lesson this evening uh, told you to go to the earthly things because they will reveal the heavenly. This pattern was materialized. Now this pattern is a direct transformation of the Creator Himself. He transformed into a threefold intangible tabernacle. Now, before I start this lecture, I would like to tell the scripture readers I'm going to give you a break. 
that I can just sit back and enjoy and relax because I'm, I'm just not hardly going to use it this evening. The reason being is because I need to expedite time. So I'll give you the references in your Bible, and if you would take paper and pencil and just write them down, uh, you can check this on your own afterwards. There's very precious minutes up here, ladies and gentlemen, and I just have to cover this ground, and I can't go into the books. It's there. It can be validated. It can be verified. <clears throat> now, in the 24th chapter of Exodus, you'll find there that they went up into this mountain, Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and seven of the elders of Israel gathered around the base of this mountain there to witness a vision. A vision of what? Your Bible shows you that it was a body of heaven in this clearness. They're looking at the God of Israel. He has feet. He has hands. They describe it as a body of heaven in its clearness. Upon the elders, he laid not his hands. And we've always heard how that the tables of stone were written with a finger. Now that's shape and form, shape and form of a body. And that transforms into a threefold intangible tabernacle in Moses' vision. And the Creator Himself is doing that. The Creator Himself is revealing this to Moses and is admonishing Moses, come down out of this mountain and make this small scale model here. It's a duplicate, material, physical, but it is a duplicate of exactly what I've showed you in that mount. You'll find that in the 25th chapter of Exodus, 40th verse. Now, this pattern of a tabernacle, if we would take five minutes and get familiar with it, and just kind of get familiar with it so that you could begin to apply it, you'd find out that it would open up quantum amounts of knowledge and understanding to you. It will explain your scriptures. It will explain the creation. It will explain one of the greatest mysteries ever, ever puzzled by man the Godhead. Now look, let's learn something about this tabernacle pattern. Now let me go to this chart here. Direct your attention right here to this chart because this is a bigger, bigger representation. First of all, we notice that the tabernacle is one, two, three. It has three compartments or sections to it, a cord around about or a fence that went all the way around, circumnavigated it with an entranceway here called a gate. It has a covered section divided into two, two rooms, one called a holy place and then a most holy place. And in these rooms or sections of the tabernacle, there are various furnishings, furniture, such as we have an altar used for sacrifice. We have a laver filled for baptisms or washings and cleansings. We have a horn full of holy anointing oil. Then we have a candlestick. For light, we have shoe bread from which sustenance is gained daily for the priesthood. And we have an altar of incense. And then in the most holy place, we have an ark, a chest-like affair in which the tables of stone from Mount Sinai and the Book of the Law and various other artifacts were deposited. And then it had a mercy seat for a lid. And the Creator Himself says that He would dwell in the cloud above the mercy seat between the wings of the archangels. Now, in two or three minutes, we've taken just a verbal description of the structure so that you could kindly get familiar with it. Now just in your mind, keep track of the fact that it's one, two, three. Now let me explain something in your Bible by that tabernacle. For most people, the Bible has been just a, 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 a terrible mystery. And the beauty of this pattern is that it takes all of the mystery right out of it right out of it. And our founder and dean guided us into an understanding of this pattern. And it just absolutely amazed us when he would continuously crack open mystery after mystery after mystery by this simple threefold pattern of a tabernacle. Now, the world goes down here to Egypt. They look at pyramids for answers. They check the angles of the passageways. They check the angles of shadows. They check the angles and azimuths of stars through the passageways. They're looking for all kinds of esoteric secrets out of structures in the earth plane. But ladies and gentlemen, this tabernacle pattern is the key. This is the one, and it, is, and it has literally been hidden from the world. It's an amazing thing, and this is what really separates us from the rest of the world. 
You understand? We have a guide. We have a standard. We have something to go by that shows, reveals, corrects, and admonishes. And it'll just keep you right on the straight and narrow in your understanding concerning your Creator. For instance, when you read in the book of Exodus, you read about a group of people called Israelites. These Israelites are in a land called Egypt. Doesn't mean anything to you. And then you find out eventually they come into another place called Canaan's land. But now look, if we took that story that's in the Exodus and followed it by the pattern of our tabernacle, what a revelation we are about to receive. Now you guess, just keep your mind right here. Just keep your eyeball right here, you see. Now look, the story in Egypt is that they have to take a lamb out they have to put its blood on the inside of the door of their home. They have to take the blood and put it at the top of the door, and they have to put it at the sides of the door, and then they have the basin, obviously, on the bottom. Now, that is coming by the tabernacle pattern because we have an altar, a divinely set up and authorized altar for sacrifice. And this sacrifice has four horns on it, and on these horns is to be placed blood. That's a daily sacrifice in this tabernacle, and there's an animal sacrifice here, and in the morning and in the evening, you'll find in the 29th chapter of Exodus, uh, a lamb has to be offered up on that altar. It's a daily sacrifice. Now, if we have an animal here, if we have four points of blood here, translate that right over into the story that you're reading in Exodus, and that's going to give you a revelation as to what's happening on, the, on that door down there in that night in Egypt. That Lamb has to be taken out. We have an animal here. We have a sacrifice in Egypt. We have a sacrifice here. We have blood here. We have blood here. We have four points here. We have four points here. Are you beginning to realize that there is a correlation between these two things? If I move <coughs> from east to west in my pattern, I would begin to make an ascent, as it were, and the next article of furniture I've come to is a labor, known as a labor uh, of water, for washing, cleansing. Now, when the priest is to cleanse the sacrifices used on this altar, you know from your own experience in your own kitchens, Thanksgiving comes around or any other day comes around when you have uh, turkey or chicken, invariably you have to take it over to the faucet and clean out the inside. And when you do that, there will be a red color uh, in the water from the blood. Am I somewhere near right about it? All right. If we wash the sacrifices that are to be on this altar here in the tabernacle pattern, if we are to wash the sacrifices in the labor or with water, and we've just killed the animal, right? And when an animal is killed, you know he's going to go on the ground. Right now, you've got to begin to carve him you understand, and to eviscerate him and, and just cut him up in pieces and take those pieces. Now, you know they're going to have little flecks of, of, of pebbles and dirt and things of that nature because he's been on the dirt and on the ground. Is that right? Therefore, we have taken to the water and the water here, the water here, once that raw flesh is washed in there, what color do you think this water may turn? Well, now you see how simple that is? You can understand that. And you really didn't have to go to seminary school to understand that. <laughs> now, if my pattern shows that I'm coming from an altar of sacrifice to a labor, a washing, a cleansing, a getting rid of something that is extemporaneous and we don't want, right? If that's the pattern working there, what do you think would be the next thing that Israel would come to on this migration. Remember, blood, blood. Four points, four points. Animal, animal. Sacrifice, sacrifice, right? It was dark when they offered this up, and this animal is for sin, and where there is sin, there is death and darkness, ladies and gentlemen, spiritually speaking. So if we have this death and darkness, death and darkness. Four points of blood, four points of blood. Sacrifice, sacrifice. Blood, blood. See, now let me just move up here. Let me move up. Follow me now. Follow me now. Don't just waver here. Stick with me. See the labor? See the water? 
What color was it? Red. What would be the next thing that Israel would have to come to, would have to come to? You understand this now? You understand this? First of all, Israel's going to have to bump into some water somewhere, somehow. The pattern shows it. Is that right? And isn't it peculiar that the Creator Himself come to an area called the Blue Sea? Red. Say what? Red. Oh, you are listening. If we have red water here, red water, red water, red water, what would it have to be in your Bible without even reading it? See how simple that was? Why, you never had that out of a Baltimore catechism. <laughs> they haven't talked to you that kind of stuff out there. Now listen. Remember how, remember how, we talked about how there's extemporaneous matter that is washed off in the kitchen sink, right? Remember how we're saying that if the animal is dead on the ground and you have to carve him up and that pick up the pieces, there's going to be little pebbles and everything down, is that right? They're going to go right down to the bottom of that labor, aren't they? Is that right or wrong? Now, if that's, if, if we've got something being deposited in the water right here. If that's what we have here, watch, watch, come right across, come right across. You're reading in the Exodus. You're right on the migration. If something is deposited in the water here and left behind, watch, watch. What's going to happen at the Red Sea? Something's going to be left behind, folks. Something's going to be deposited. And Pharaoh and his host, you got it now? You understand that? You see that? They dropped this rock, this stone. You see how simple that is? Well, that's not, you, you still, nobody's been to seminary school yet, right? Okay. Now we can see that <clears throat> there's a horn full of holy anointing oil here. This represents something, the physical, the material. It represents something spiritual. And you read that this, uh, in this evening's uh, scripture lesson. Now, this holy anointing oil represents spirit. It represents the creator himself. Now, if this oil represents spirit, come right straight across now, our guests, please follow me on these charts. Please don't wander. Please don't let anything break your vibration. Just follow me on the chart. Look up here on the chart. If the oil represents spirit, then if I come, I come, I come right across, you understand? And I hit it here, I hit it here. Sacrifice, sacrifice. Blood, blood. Four points, four points. Dark, dark. You understand? If I hit it, if I'm hitting it, Lamb, lamb. Water, water. Cleansing, something left behind. Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, something left behind. Is that right? I'm hitting it all the way now. I'm not missing. If I've got a holy anointing oil representing spirit, and I come right across, then there has got to be something in this story that's going to repeat that principle. There's got to be something in this story that's going to represent spirit. Got to be there. We haven't missed it yet. You understand this? And sure enough, when you read the Exodus, you read the 14th chapter of Exodus, you'll find out that there was a cloud there. This is not your average everyday cloud. This cloud is a little different, ladies and gentlemen, because in the land of Egypt, clouds are hard to come by. It's a desert. Clouds are hard to come by. Now, when you've got a cloud, just a singular cloud, floating around out there, you understand? It's going to stick out like a sore thumb. 
There wasn't another cloud in the sky because Yahweh does not allow confusion. You see? When he lays something out there, he lays it out there plain enough for you to say, well, that, that's it. There isn't nothing there is else. Is that right? So there isn't another cloud in the sky, folks. There is no other cloud to be confused with a phenomenal cloud. What makes it so phenomenal? Well, it's a pillar of a cloud, you understand? And it's a cloud by day, but it turned burning inferno by night, and it lighted their way. And you'll find in the 14th chapter of Exodus that someone was standing in that cloud. And in that cloud was the great creator himself, Yahweh Elohim, properly identified. Not Lord God. Now, this holy anointing all represented spirit. I'm saying to you that that cloud and that holy anointing oil, you understand, you understand how it's working now? Spirit. You understand? See how it works now? Spirit. You see how simple that is? If I have an entranceway into this tabernacle, if I have an entranceway into the tabernacle, see this little structure right here? Look up on the big screens here. You see? There's a structure in this. This is like the fence around your house. Now you understand it? This is like a, like a big fence around your house. And inside was your house, all right? Therefore, this house or tent-like structure is divided into two sections. But it has to have a doorway to get in there. Now there's a door here, a door to go from this compartment to this compartment. We're going from one to two, see? Now we made all our good solid correlations down here. We made our good correlations down here, you see. We can see something working on, on, on this migration with Israel. Now, if there's a door here in the pattern, if there's a door in the pattern, now what do you think? Just come right straight across now in your mind. I'm talking to our guests. Just come right straight across here in your mind. What do you think if there is a narrow way to come into here, if there is a just, see, if, if there's an access way to come into here, you understand? What do you think we're going to have to find down here in this story? If we've got a door here, what do you think we're going to have to find in the story? There's going to have to be some kind of excess way or exit. Is that right? And therefore, the Red Sea is going to part to make a door because the Creator is working by a pattern. He's working by a pattern which really is, as I have just told you, him himself. He is well familiar with the pattern because it is him himself. And there's no parts of him himself that he's not aware of. You follow that? So therefore, when he comes in the Exodus to the Red Sea, the Red Sea is going to have to part because we have to follow our pattern, and the pattern shows a doorway or an access way or an entrance way from one section to another section. From one section to another section. Now you see how that works? Now you see how simple that is? Now, you're reading in your Old Testament, ladies and gentlemen, and a lot of your Bibles sometimes don't even have the Old Testament. You say, well, does this pattern work just in the Old Testament? Yeah, I see that. That, that, that looks kind of convenient. That's convenient coincidence. That's a poor choice of words on your part because you just blew out your own argument. The word coincidence means 
in exact agreement. Yes, it is a very convenient coincidence. <laughs> it is an exact blood, blood, sacrifice, sacrifice. Four points, four points. You understand it now? It's an exact water, water, dirt, dirt, oil, spirit. It's an exact agreement. Door, door. And this is what the founder and dean seen in a great stupendous vision in 1931, and the creator revealed it to him. He himself didn't know it. He himself didn't understand it. And had taught the Bible, was a bibliomaniac. He could, you could just open the Bible on your lap, quote a verse from any page. He would, you just throw it at him, and he'd quote you the verse back that is above it and the verse below it. And you just take your best shot. He was a bibliomaniac and openly admitted that he himself just didn't understand it all like that. Not like he'd seen in the vision. Uh-uh. And after this great stupendous vision, which organized, organized all of the Bible in his mind, that vision revolutionized his entire concept and thinking about that Bible that he had been preaching from for 15 years. And after the vision, he himself had had to go back into the Bible and reread those pages. And so, uh, uh, wow. You understand? Trying to say that, well, I know I had that right. And then he had to admit, no, I didn't have that right. And he said, well, I, I, I flip over here. I'll have, well, I had that. No, I didn't have that right. And that man had to come to the conclusion after the vision that he didn't have no parts of the story. No parts of the story. Neither did we when we walked in here. You know, I was dumb when I walked in here. Play Johnny Carson with you. How dumb were you? <laughs> well, I was dumber than an owl. Now what you talking about? And I always say, who? I never even asked, who? <laughs> See what I mean? So I had to come here, come to school, sit on a chair. Somebody had to get up in front of me, start in. Now listen, Mitch, this is blood. Start in, back and forth, back and forth back and forth, and even introduced me to my own creator. I had the slightest idea of Yahweh and Elohim and Yahshua. I didn't even have the sense to ask who. Is that right? But now since being in this school, since having been a partaker of the understanding of this great stupendous vision given to us by our founder and dean, having understood the revelation that he showed us, showed us of, the, of the creator's name of Yahweh and the great title of Elohim and the name of our Messiah correctly identified Yahshua the Messiah. I, know, I now understand those names. I understand the sanctity of those names. I understand the import of those names. You understand that? And because I now know my creator as he actually is and truthfully exists, beginning with a proper identification of his name, that makes me wiser than the owl. Because the owl is still asking, <laughs> See what I mean? 
that made me then to come into the light of understanding, a child of the light. And the owl is still out there as a child of the night crying, whoo, whoo. <laughs> you understand it? And now we've come to love these names. And we give a hoot about them. <laughs> Take it easy now. Dr. Harris, they're nervous. <laughs> they're rustling on me. <laughs> now we have three things here that are just easy to understand. Easy to understand. Blood, water, spirit. You can see blood here in the Exodus, water at the Red Sea, and the cloud representing spirit. You can see that. You can see a door here, and you can see a door here. Well, in Galatians 3.24, you'll find out that everything back here was a schoolmaster. Everything here was a schoolmaster. And a schoolmaster is a master teacher. Master teacher. And what was it doing? It was pointing like an arrow. Pointing like an arrow to Joshua the Messiah. These things are visible, they are physical, and they are tangible. And if we will get familiar with the physical and proper, properly interpret it, to its relationship to our Creator, it'll give us a quantum leap in our understanding. You talk about peace. You've never had peace come into your life. What you will experience the day you know your Creator as He actually is and truthfully exists. You talk about going home and sleeping asleep you understand? Now, how would these things show our Creator? How would it point out the Messiah? Why, he himself says, I've had to come in here to fulfill. Therefore, Moses didn't institute this exodus. Moses didn't institute this pattern. This, was come, this come right from the Creator Himself. Moses didn't know what to do to get out of Egypt. This come right from the Creator Himself. To prove that, you understand, they wanted to build cities, pyramids, everything else but this little tabernacle, you see. The Creator says, no, this is the way I want it. Why? Because it shows me. Well, how does it show you? Well, watch, when I come in, then I'm going to fulfill these things. You see that? How are you going to fulfill them things? Well, if there's a lamb here or there's an animal here, if there's a sacrifice here and there's one here in this Exodus, then in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, you're going to read there an entire chapter concerning a lamb. But the lamb or the chapter is really confirming how that the animal back here was led to the slaughter, how the animal even back here was dumb. You understand? This animal, see, look, when the Creator made the animal back here in the Genesis, He made him with such characteristics, with such a nature, that its nature would reveal Him, Him, when He comes. So when an animal go, like a lamb goes down to death, it just placidly walks down to the blade. Just placidly walks to death, or placidly walks to the blade. Silent obedience. Now that's the quality of the animal. You'll never get that out of a hog. <laughs> You'll hear a hog squeal, about a mile away, if he even smells blood. And you've heard about wolves and clothing. You want to know how to separate them? They're both looking alike. The lamb has got sheep clothing on. The wolf 
It's got sheep's clothing on. They both look alike. Is that right? How are you going to tell them apart? Lead them up to the altar. <laughs> that wolf's going to do one of these numbers. <laughs> See what I mean? Because that's hypocrisy to wear the lamb's clothes. Hypocrisy. Now here, we can read in Matthew, the 27th chapter, how that Messiah stood before Pilate. And your book reads over there that he was standing up there and he never opened his mouth. And you might puzzle over that. You might wonder about that. Well, let me take the wonder out of it for you by a pattern that works with unerring accuracy. If the animal is back here and it goes down to death without even opening its mouth, you understand? And if I could even go back for a minute and digress back even to the story of Abraham and Isaac. Isaac, he was as a lamb led to the slaughter. And when he got up on that altar, he was still obedient to his father. He was obedient unto death, just like a lamb. So we can pick up this principle coming all the way down through here. Now when we come down to the Messiah, he comes in and says, well, I'm going to have to fulfill these things. I'll have to fulfill them. I know I set it up too. I set it up, I told Moses here what to, what to do, and I showed him how to build the tabernacle. And I did all that to show me when I come. And all of this has been written down in a book. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy called the Law. And it's confirmed in the prophets that it is accurate. The same one that inspired the, the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy is the same one that has inspired the writings of the prophets. So there can be no variance. What is in the law must be confirmed in the prophets. If it's instituted in the law, it must be confirmed in the prophets. And that's why it's vital for you to go back into what you call the Old Testament of your Bible. Don't throw it out. Do not throw it out. Bring it to class and begin to understand it. Come to class and let the Creator Himself open it up for you. How's that? This is Him. This is Him. This is a body. This is the Creator Himself. He is the archetype or the original pattern of everything. And he's the one, if I'm showing you your scriptures are going by a pattern, I can also say that the pattern is revealing how those scriptures are going. That is him himself. And this is him. This is a fully, this is a man standing here. This is a man standing here. This is him, 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 him. It's the whole story is him. It is his story. History. Therefore, when he comes in, he has no alternative. If he's instituted the whole story, then he's confirmed it in the prophets. Now he's coming in here to say, well, it's all pointing me out, folks. And to prove it, I'm going to repeat everything. I'm going to fulfill it. Is that right? Therefore, when he stands before Pilate, and you read in the 27th chapter of Matthew, that he opened out not his mouth, he never even said a word. And Pilate marveled at that. He says, man, don't you know I have the power to release you? It stuck out like a sore thumb, him being mute. Why? Because Pilate is used to having people come up there screaming, hey, I'm innocent, man. I ain't done nothing. 
I'm not guilty of this. Don't you try to kill me. I ain't say, hey, you understand? And here comes one who's totally innocent. Just standing there. Why, why, why don't you open your mouth and defend yourself? Reason. There's a reason. It's because he is fulfilling, fulfilling the scripture to the jot and to the tittle. Is that right? And there could be no bruise, no guile found in his mouth. Why? They couldn't find anything wrong with him. Why couldn't they find anything wrong with him? Is because that's back here in the law. This lamb has to be spotless. But don't forget, it also had to be examined. Is that right? Where is that confirmed in the prophets? Sixth chapter of Daniel. When you go to Daniel, you'll find out there, they did a job on Daniel. They looked him top to bottom. They examined him, you understand? He too was a meek man, but they couldn't find a thing wrong, not a spot, not a blank. He was clean. They couldn't find any reason to accuse him of. They got him by false accusation. Got him by false accusation. He's clean, you understand? The lamb is clean. Has to be without spot and blemish. Confirmed in the prophet by Daniel, you understand? And now look at it. He stands up there and just like a lamb, going down to slaughter, repeating Isaac, going down to death in obedience. Stood out there in the garden. I mean, kneeled up. He said, look, not my will, Father, but that thy will be done. Let this cup pass from me. But no, I, I'll, I'll do it. I'll go. Went right on down, obedient to that degradation, you understand? The creator of heaven and earth himself, humbling himself, as your second speaker, uh, Roger Jackson, has talked about. Humbled himself down and was obedient to the, to the indignation of the cross. But he's fulfilling to the jot and to the tittle. Fulfilling. Oh, yeah. Because Isaac, Isaac had to carry the wood to his death, as it were. Is that right? This priest has to carry the wood here because this is a daily ministration and that fire has to be there for that sacrifice. Israel had to carry the wood here. They come out of Egypt with the kneading boards all tied up in the garments back there. Is that right? So you see there's some wood carrying going on all the way down through them scriptures. And it goes right on back to Noah back here. You know they certainly were carrying wood. Is that right? And it goes even back farther than that. Because after they come out of that garden, the first thing you read about is that Abel offered up a sacrifice. And Cain offered up a sacrifice. But there was a difference in those sacrifices. Is that right? <laughs> now let me just touch this a minute. What was Cain's sacrifice? First fruits. So that meant, where did he get them? From the ground. From the ground. What was his occupation? Tiller. Farmer. You understand? Husbandman, tiller of the ground. What was Abel's sacrifice? A lamb. What was his occupation? Shepherd. A shepherd. If he's a shepherd, what was, what was his clothing? If he's a shepherd, you know he had to be clothed in sheepskin. But Cain, 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 what was his occupation? Where did he get his clothes from? Where did he get his clothes from? He's not, he's not clothing himself with corn husks, although we use the expression of shucking and jiving. <laughs> Do you see how that, you see what I mean? He was getting his clothes from Abel. Now, if you realize what spirit is in Cain, he was a murderer right from the start, then that goes back to that wolf in sheep's clothing that I talked about. Is that right?
So we got Abel offering up a firstborn of the flock. To do that, he's got to have fire. And to have fire, what did Abel have to do? Gonna have to be some wood carrying by Abel. Gonna have to be some wood carrying by Noah. Gonna have to be some wood carrying by Israel. Gonna be some wood carrying by our pattern. The priest, is that right? Down the story of Jonah. They tried to lighten that ship. What do you think they were carrying? Rock? Was that a mistake? <laughs> you better enjoy this conference, ladies and gentlemen. This is the last time. This is the last time we'll see each other until consummation. And you've had a beautiful time here. Enjoy each other's company. It is so precious. It is so precious. It's been a beautiful conference. The love here, the love here outweighs, outsurpasses all of the problems that we've had. Right. Blacks haven't had a problem with whites. Whites haven't had problems with blacks. Males haven't had problems with females. Females haven't had a problem. You understand how it's all going together? Why? It's brothers and sisters. It's without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste, and color. Isn't that right? <laughs> I've never said hello, hi, how are you so many times in my life as I have this past week. Now for our guests, just let me, uh, just allow me just a minute to, to do this. We must do this. I haven't done anything unless I do. Our Messiah had to go through a death, and that death was reflected all the way back through those scriptures. He is the Lamb, as John the Baptist identified him in John 1.29. Therefore, the Lamb cannot have any bones broken. There was no bones broken, no bones broken. You understand? So when they come up to break his legs, they broke the thieves, but something had changed the mind of that soldier. That something was hanging right on that cross saying, don't you do that. <laughs> Why? Because I've got to fulfill the lamb cannot have any bones broken. Why? Because bones, 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 bones. Bones reflect the inner man, and inside we all look the same, ladies and gentlemen. Female has got white bones. Male has got white bones. Black has got white bones. White has got white bones. We all got God bones. <laughs> I ain't got rhythm, but boy, you can make a song out of that, you understand? <laughs> Am I done? Is that it? <laughs> <laughs> now, how do you spell a bone? B-O-N-E. Folks, look at it. Look at it. The Creator's telling you something. On the inside, that's where we can... Thank you. You see how that works? So here it is, dark, it's dark, it's dark. You understand? No bones broken, no bones broken, no bones broken. He's the lamb, there's the lamb, there's the lamb all the way down the line. There's the soldiers at the tomb repeating the soldiers in Daniel when Daniel went down to the lion's tomb. You understand? And repeating the soldiers over there. If these soldiers in the law went down, if those soldiers in Daniel went down, you understand? Got any ideas to what you're going to read over in Matthew about these soldiers over here? Have you got any idea at all? These soldiers are going to have to go down because there's something went down here at this labor. 
You see, didn't we talk about that? You see how that works? Something got to go down. Spirit, spirit, you understand? Then I got to have an angel at that tomb. Why? Because that angel's got to be right at the door. Why? Because I got a door, I got a door. You see how that works? He fulfilled your scriptures to the job and to the diddle, and ladies and gentlemen, it is worth your while to come back here and find out about it. Now look, I'm going to say this because I got to get out of here. See? Now, <clears throat> there's no need for anyone, as Roger Jackson well said, to be worrying about weapons. That's just carnality. That's the way of the world. And all you're doing is protecting the flesh. Is that right? And look at what sometimes they call that. You know, sometimes a person can have a pistol in their pocket. And they call that a peacemaker. Right? Now, why in the Sam Fat do you have the peacemaker on the outside of your heart? When are you going to get the peacemaker inside of that heart? Does that make sense to you now? See? This, this is top gun. You want to be macho, you preach this gospel. Right. Why? Because I've been around the world with it. I know this is top gun. Right. You understand? I had, to, I had to rely on it. You see? Now, you, you talked about the founder and the dean having sold uh, life insurance. I'll tell you why I don't carry a gun. Because the founder and dean in 1971 told us this. He says, listen, if they lay a hand on you, I'll pull it down. That is life insurance. And I bought it. <laughs> now, right now, I'm done. I got to get out of here, but I'm packing. And I'm going to leave you with a visual aid so that you can understand something. I'm packing. <laughs> See, you didn't know that. See a little balls there? See that little boundary there? I'm going to say, oh, my God. <laughs> this is what I'm packing. One of the greatest inventions going. You know what that is? I'll tell you what that is. When you leave this conference, you remember this. This is the easiest way to teach people. Visual aids and illustrations. Now, look. This is what I come to class with. I got to get off this floor, and this is too good. <laughs> this is good stuff. Now, I got to have the Spirit help me with this. You don't mind. I got I to gotta have the Spirit help me with this. You got any ideas of what I got here? 
Now listen. You call this a trash bag. If I would take all of my stubbornness, if I would take all of my disobedience, if I would take all of my hate, you, you got this now? If I take all of that that Yahweh does not like and put it in the bag and get rid of it, do you realize, ladies and gentlemen, that this is called a glad bag? I got the mic? Okay. I'd like to call David Rosen. He has an announcement to make. 